Hello, and welcome to the final topic of our talk, which will be about estimating the spectrum. The power spectral density is a quantity that is of interest in a wide range of disciplines, like astrophysics, telecommunications, natural sound processing, material sciences, and so on. But its estimation is often difficult, because samples of the underlying function are limited, noisily, noisy, and often sampled at points spaced non-uniformly in time. Consider, for example, the data set, the data set shown below in the figure, where the data points are depicted by the blue dots. Suppose that our posterior belief over the underlying function is depicted in green. Then, even at points um, that we sampled here, we're not entirely certain about the value of the underlying function. And in between irregular samples especially, like in between these two, we can be very uncertain about the underlying function. These sources of uncertainty, if we're, properly, if we're being properly Bayesian about this, should translate to uncertainty um, in our estimate of the PSD of the underlying function. Unfortunately, typically, classical methods don't properly take this into account. Estimators of the PSD can roughly be categorized as uh, firstly, parametric methods, which typically assume a parametric form of the function, where the parameters are often estimated from data, which then results in the parametric form of the, of the PSD. We have already seen two modern examples of this, um, the sparse spectrum approximation, where we parameterize the PSD with a symmetric average of lines, and the spectral mixture kernel, where we parameterize the PSD with a symmetric mixture of Gaussians. The second category of estimators are non-parametric methods that don't make any assumptions about structure, like the fast Fourier transform. Um, we also have seen a modern example of this category, that is the Gaussian process convolution model, which induces a non-parametric prior over PSDs through a cleverly transformed Gaussian process. In this topic, we'll be discussing a novel model um, for spectrum estimation, recently introduced by Philippe Tobar, called Bayesian Non-Parametric Spectra Estimation, and abbreviated BNSE. A first take on a Gaussian process-based model for spectral estimation might be the following. Suppose that our underlying signal is modeled with a GP with a stationary kernel, and we denote our underlying signal by F again. Then, given our underlying signal, the power spectral density, here denoted by S xi, is given by the squared modulus of the Fourier transform of f, where we denote the Fourier transform of a function by f hat. Then, given some data where we, we denote uh, our vector of observations by e, so that would be, say, observed values y1 to yn, we can construct an estimator simply by taking the conditional expectation of S xi given the data. Now this seems simple and nice, but unfortunately it doesn't work. And that's because if f is stationary, then samples from this GP are almost surely not integrable. And that means that its Fourier transform doesn't exist. Um, so we, so, so this, is, this is ill defined here. So that doesn't work. Instead, to fix this, we look at a windowed version of f, fw, which we construct by just taking f and multiplying it by a window function w. So this we call window function. Um, for example, how this might look like. Um, suppose that a sample of f is, is given in green here, and our window function is simply a rectangular window this one here, then the product of the two, um, so whereas f might not be integrable because it has support everywhere, now the window sets it to zero outside the window. So the resulting function, the windowed version of f showed in red, clearly is integrable, so we can Fourier transform it. The effect of a window function is best understood in the frequency domain. By the convolution theorem, multiplying our underlying function f t with the window function wt is equivalent to, in the frequency domain, 
convolving um, the Fourier transform of our underlying function f hat with the Fourier transform of that of that window function w hat. So now we understand that the application uh, of a window function smooths the spectrum of our underlying signal through convolution with the Fourier transform of the window function. This is visualized in this figure here, where, sorry, the, the quantities depicted are moduli. We're supposed that our underlying signal, um, its spectrum consists of two nice clean spikes, clean lines, meaning that it, it consists of two very pure frequency components. Then if we apply, say, a rectangular window, whose Fourier transform is a sync function, then after convolution, these nice thin lines are fattened and side lobes are introduced, like here, and it all becomes a little bit messy. The use of window function is very commonplace in signal processing. They can either be used for algorithmic purposes, for example, in this case, we use them to ensure integrability of our signal, or they can arise as a consequence of acquisition devices. For example, in practice, we can only observe a signal for a finite amount of time, which means that, in some sense, we always have some kind of rectangular, perhaps very wide, but, but finitely wide window function. And sampling is often modeled by a window function that is an impulse train, um, which is often denoted by the SHA symbol. With this windowed version of f, our generative model for spectral estimation becomes the following. We model our underlying signal f with a gp with a stationary kernel k. Um, we then multiply it with the window function w to ensure that it's integrable. And then finally, we generate the, the power spectral density associated to this windowed version of f by Fourier transforming it and taking the square of its modulus. We call the, the spectrum of the windowed version of f a local spectrum of f because it corresponds to the spectrum of the part of f filtered out by the window. Um, we can now construct an estimator for the PSD, which is um, simply a conditional expectation given the data. If we, if we plug in the, this form for the power spectral density in there, we see that our estimator equals the conditional expectation of the square of the real part um, of f hat w plus the square of the imaginary part of f hat w, but given the data. Now, these things are simply um, posterior second moments. So posterior second moments. And those just follow from the usual rules of conditioning GPs um, on observations, if we can compute the cross correlation between f hat w, um, the real part thereof, and the imaginary part thereof with the data, and if we can compute this kernel. And this is the model introduced by Philippe Tobar in his paper um, called Bayesian non parametric spectral estimation, abbreviated uh, BNSC. That's what this is. For tractability, um, we choose the window to be an exponential function and the kernel of the, of the GP of our underlying signal, we let it either be a spectral mixture kernel, flexibility, or in simple cases, just an EQ. But we'll see later how other kernels can be used as well. Let us detail a little bit how these posterior moments may be calculated. Um, first, a word on notation will denote the covariance function between the conjugate of f and g by kfg, which we'll also refer to as the kernel between f and g. And we'll denote the Fourier transform of a function f of t in this way, where we sometimes explicitly denote the, the variable um, that we Fourier transform, like so. What we desire, as pointed out on the previous slides, are the the kernels, the, the covariance functions of the real and the imaginary part of f hat, these two, and their cross correlations um, with the data. Then, if we plug these in in the usual formulas for conditioning GPs and observations, we can compute the estimator of the PSD 
shown on the previous slides. It turns out that these four quantities, which are four calculations, um, can be obtained from the, the complex valued kernel of f hat w, this one, and um, from the cross correlation of f hat w and the observations. So since, on, since the right-hand side only contains two unknown quantities, which are two calculations, for simplicity, we'll, we'll calculate those. Let us first perform a calculation for the complex valued uh, covariance function of f hat w, which is defined in this way. Recall that f hat w is the Fourier transform of f multiplied by the window function w, so if we substitute that in, we get the following. We can now take the expectation inside and observe that the expectation of ft multiplied by ft prime is, is precisely the kernel of f, ktt prime. And if we, so if we take the expectation inside and then apply the convolution theorem, we get the following result. Let's take a look at the, at the quantity on the left, this here. If we first perform the Fourier transform with respect to the variable t, we get the, the Fourier transform of the kernel k, and we denote this Fourier transform by k hat as a function of u. And remember that shifting in the time domain is equivalent to multiplying by a complex exponential in frequency domain, we get k hat u multiplied by e to the power of minus 2 pi i t prime uh, u. If we then perform the Fourier transform with respect to t prime, then this complex exponential turns to a direct delta. Um, the quantity on the right will denote by r hat w. So we get the following results. r hat w admits a nice closed form, um, as shown on the slide. If we now write the convolution, uh, this convolution uh, out explicitly as an, as an integration, uh, like so, and if we then perform the integration with respect to the variable u prime to get rid of the delta here, we get the following. And now this is a one-dimensional convolution, which we can write as follows. If we just pause for a sec to interpret this, we, we recognize here the, the Fourier transform of the kernel um, of the GP that models our underlying signal. So this is the sort of the PSD that we assumed a priori, a priori kind of, this constitutes our prior knowledge, this thing here, um, which is then smoothed by um, a normal density whose width depends on the width of the of the window function that we apply to our underlying signal. And finally, this quantity as a whole is multiplied by sort of a another frequency domain window function, if you will, um, evaluated at the difference of the frequencies. The cross correlation between the observations and f hat w admits a very similar calculation, which fortunately is a little bit easier. Um, we start out with the definition, um, where we recall that f hat w is the Fourier transform of f multiplied by the window function w. We then take the expectation in sides uh, to get the following. We then apply the convolution theorem um, to already end up at the final result. Almost, almost, because we still have the, the Fourier transform of the window here. But again, that's easy, because the window is just a, a simple exponential function. So this is the, the final form of the cross covariance between f hat w and the observations y. Um, I'd like to point out that these calculations were originally done by Felipe Tobar in his, in his paper. Here are the final expressions for the covariance function of f hat w and its um, cross covariance with the observations y. We're almost done with the calculation, but we still need to compute the Fourier transform of the kernel of our underlying signal k hat u, and then convolve um, that Fourier transform with a normal density, both here in the kernel and here in the cross kernel. For a Gaussian kernel k, this is tractable, because the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is again a Gaussian, and a Gaussian convolved with a Gaussian is another Gaussian, so that's pretty easy. But for more complicated kernels, the Fourier transform might be of a different form, and then a convolution with the normal density, 
here and there, well, that might not be so easy. In such cases, to make this work with more with other kernels than just EQ and a spectral mixture kernel, um, we use an approximation where we let the, the width of the window that we apply to f go to infinity, which corresponds to alpha going to zero. In that case, um, these normal distributions, there and there, they become very, very thin, and they integrate to one. That is, in the limit that alpha goes to zero, they become direct deltas. And uh, since the convolution of a function with the direct delta is just the function itself, um, in the limit that alpha goes to zero, for the kernel, we obtain the following approximation, where we know that the, the convolution is evaluated at the average of the frequencies. And for the cross-correlation between f hat w uh, and the observations y, we obtain the following approximation. And here we can just simply Fourier transform the kernel, plug it in, and that works for any kernel, so that's very nice. Cool. Now that we have these expressions, we can take a look at the posterior mean, which is given by the following expression. This may look a little bit complicated, but, but don't worry, it actually has quite a nice interpretation. Um, if we look closely, we recognize a discrete Fourier transform of a widened version of the observations, where Ke is the covariance matrix, the covariance matrix of the observations. Um, this discrete Fourier transform is then weighted by the Fourier transform of the kernel of our underlying signal here, which constitutes our prior knowledge, and finally smooth it in a convolution here, due to that we windowed f um, in our generative model. Suppose that we take are prior to be uninformative, which means that the, the covariance matrix of our observations is roughly the identity matrix. And we look at the limit that the, the window becomes infinitely wide, which is the, the limit that alpha goes to zero. Um, if Ke is roughly the identity matrix, then this simply becomes the ith observation, which means that this becomes a discrete Fourier transform of our observations. And in the limits, that alpha goes to zero, um, this becomes a direct delta. Uh, so if we perform this convolution, we get the following result. And that has a very nice interpretation as the discrete Fourier transform of our observations weighted by our prior knowledge. I'd like to briefly compare Bayesian non-parametric spectral estimation to a commonly used method for estimating the power spectral density of non-uniformly sampled data, called the lumps cargo periodogram. What it does is that for every frequency xi, it fits a sign using least squares. So it assumes a function of the following form and estimates these coefficients a and b by minimizing the squared error with respect to the data. Then to estimate the power present at frequency xi, it estimates the power contained in, the, in our fit f. Compared to uh, Bayesian non-parametric spectral estimation, the lumps cargo method is a deterministic method, meaning it only gives you a point estimate of the spectrum. In comparison, BNNC assumes a probabilistic model. So, for example, through the use of Monte Carlo sampling, you can get error bars in your estimates of the power spectral density, and in certain applications that can be very important. Additionally, the lumps cargo method assumes a parametric form of the underlying function, this one there. BNSE, on the other hand, uses a non-parametric model, that is, our GP prior, which is much more flexible. Finally, and this is probably, probably the most important difference, the Lumps cargo method has to perform an optimization for every frequency that you query. In comparison, BNSE gives you a closed form estimates um, of the PSD. And th this is especially important if you want to say, optimize the power spectral density to find frequencies present in your signal. For the Lumps cargo method, for every new frequency that you get you query, you have to do a new optimization. That's very expensive, and it's pretty difficult to get gradients at. Um, but for BNSE, you have a closed form estimate of your function, um, so you could even implement it using TensorFlow, automatically get gradients out using automatic differentiation, and then plug it into an optimizer, say LB of GS, to find your periodicities. Super nice.
Finally, it turns out that if you, if instead of choosing these coefficients a and b using least squares, you assume a particular Gaussian prior over them, then you can recover b and a c um, in a particular limits, uh, b and a c with the spectral mixture kernel. For details, I'd like to refer you to the original paper. Let's consider an example from, taken from the original paper, where b and a z is used to estimate the PSD of two heart rate signals. The kernel that is used is the spectral mixture kernel. The parameters of the spectral mixture kernel are uh, learned, are trained, on the first heart rate signal, and these values are then fixed and used to estimate the PSD of the second signal. The purpose of this experiment is to, to determine if any overfitting happens. The results are shown here. Note that the, the result on the test set looks pretty good, which means that there's no overfitting and, and training on the first signal actually did capture meaningful, meaningful structure present in the signal. Secondly, note that BNSC provides uh, nice uncertainty intervals, nice error bars, that captures the estimate of the lumps cargo method. Finally, um, notice that BNSE is trained on only 10% of the data, whereas the lumps cargo method used all the data. And, and still the results looks, looks pretty good. So I'd say that's, that's quite, expressive, uh, quite impressive. All right, let's wrap up. BNSE is a novel non-parametric model for spectrum estimation recently introduced by Felipe Tobar. Um, the model is Bayesian in nature, which means that uncertainty deriving from having only finitely many observations or noisy observations is handled automatically and also gives you error bars on the estimate of your PSD, which can be super important. A unique benefit of the model is that it provides a closed form estimate of the PSD, which is especially nice if you want to optimize the PSD to find periodicities present in your signal. Thank you.